Senhoras e senhores, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, participants, welcome to Portugal. Bem-vindos a Portugal. Uh, with the permission of Her Excellency the Minister of Justice and uh, the member of uh, the Board of Administration, the Executive Administrator, and our host, Dr. Guilherme Oliveira Martins, we are opening this conference and I invite Dr. Guilherme Martins to address our conference. Thank you so much. Muito bom dia, ladies and gentlemen. Senhora Ministra da Justiça, é sempre um gosto acolhê-la nesta casa. Uh, Mr. President of the Honorary Committee uh, of uh, IDLDR, Sr. Representante do Sr. Presidente da Comissão Portuguesa da Liberdade Religiosa, Sr. Presidente uh, Pastor Mário de Brito, muito gosto. Ladies and gentlemen, só duas palavras muito uh, simples de boas-vindas. A Fundação Gulbenkian, desde a sua fundação, é uma instituição que prossegue quatro fins estatutários ligados à educação, à arte, à ciência, à filantropia, mas ao recebermos a Conferência Internacional sobre a Religião e a Liberdade de Expressão, nós temos um particular gosto, um particular interesse e empenhamento, uma vez que os temas que aqui irão ser tratados relativamente à liberdade religiosa, à liberdade de expressão, no fundo aos elementos cruciais da construção da democracia, levam-nos naturalmente a acolher esta conferência com um redobrado interesse. Por isso, uma saudação muito especial à Sra. Ministra Dra. Catarina Sarmento e Castro, uma saudação muito especial à Ms. Adama Dieng, for us is uh, an Big honor to receive this organization, this initiative. A Fundação Carlos Gulbenkian foi fundada em 1956, com base nas disposições estatutárias do nosso fundador, Carlos Sarkis Gulbenkian, personalidade muito empenhada não apenas nos temas ligados à economia e à cultura, mas também no diálogo entre culturas e civilizações. E não podemos esquecer que não há liberdade entre os povos se não houver paz entre as religiões. Hans King afirmou, não podemos deixar de recordar essa sua referência. O símbolo da Fundação Carlos Colbin, que é, são 
quatro cavalos que correspondem exatamente aos quatro objetivos estatutários. E neste momento definimos para os próximos cinco anos dois objetivos estratégicos que se ligam intimamente relativamente aos temas que aqui tratamos. E os dois objetivos estratégicos têm a ver com a equidade e com a sustentabilidade. E se falo de equidade, refiro naturalmente o primado da lei, rule of law, mas simultaneamente a legitimidade, a legitimidade da origem do voto, a legitimidade do exercício e simultaneamente a justiça, a justiça como valor. E é essa preocupação, naturalmente, que leva a Fundação Carlos Covenquian, ao longo da sua vida, a ter correspondido a esse objetivo exigente que é garantir a todos a dignidade necessária. E se falamos da dignidade para todos, se falamos de justiça, se falamos de liberdade, falamos naturalmente do facto de, sendo a Fundação Carlos Covenquian uma das 40 maiores fundações do mundo, e todos conhecem naturalmente a grande diversidade, mas simultaneamente a grande exigência neste setor fundacional, não esquecemos, ao recebermos iniciativas como esta, Conferência Internacional sobre a Religião e sobre a Liberdade de Expressão, nós estamos exatamente a cumprir aquilo que foram as preocupações iniciais do nosso fundador, Carlos Sarkis Gulbenkian. O nosso museu, o nosso Centro de Arte Moderna, que no próximo ano será reaberto com uma especial importância na sua, no seu envolvimento relativamente à criatividade, à arte, à inovação, mas simultaneamente também à ciência, à investigação e à inovação. Tudo isto significa, no fundo, que recebemos de braços abertos a Conferência Internacional sobre a Religião e a Liberdade de Expressão, desejando a todos um bom trabalho e que sejam, naturalmente, muito bem-vindos a esta instituição. Muito obrigado. Agradecendo a sua excelência, o Sr. Administrador Executivo da Gulbenkian, Dr. Guilherme Oliveira Martins, eu convido agora uh, o Pastor Mário Brito, Presidente da IDLR, a poder dirigir-se a esta conferência. Excelentíssima Senhora Ministra da Justiça, Professora Dra. Catarina Sarmenti Castro, Excelentíssimo Senhor Diretor Executivo do Conselho da Administração da Fundação Gulbiancan, Dr. Guilherme Oliveira Martins, Excelentíssimo Senhor Presidente ou Vice-Presidente da Comissão de Liberdade Religiosa, Dr. Fernando Loja Soares. Dr. Loja, Dr. Fernando Soares Loja, sem reverter os nomes. Her Excellency Professor Nazila Ganea. United Nations Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Religion or Belief. His Excellency Dr. Ibrahim Salama, Director of Human Rights Treaties, Division Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. His Excellency Dr. Ganun Diop, Secretary of the Ge General Secretary of the International Religious Liberty Association. His Excellency Antonio Almeida Ribeiro and other representatives of CAICI. Distinguished speakers. Excelentíssimo Senhor Diretor, Senhora e Senhora Coordenadora e membros do Grupo de Trabalho para Diálogo Interreligioso do Alto Comissariado para Migrações. 
dear members of the Honorary Committee and the Experts Committee of IADLR. I'm just explaining what it means. Association Internationale pour la Défense de la Liberté Religieuse. If you put it in English, the letters are not in the right order, but the name is in French, original name. This is the reason. It's just to discodify a little bit it. Dear representatives of the national chapters of AIDLR and their distinguished invitees, on behalf of AIDLR, it is with great joy and the feeling of honor that we welcome each of you who have accepted our invitation to come together in this cosmopolitan and welcoming city of Lisbon for this two-day meeting in which we shall reflect together on the fundamental theme, religion and freedom of expression. Over the 70s, 77 years of AADLR, this association has sought to be an aggregator of individual and institutional wills in favor of religious freedom, with a particular focus on the freedom of conscience and the principle of separation between state and religious institutions. In an interview in 1967, Jean Nussbaum, one of the founders of this association, was asked what interests he represented. With bewildering simplicity, he replied, I do not represent any interest but the principle, the principle of religious liberty. In uttering these words and through his action, Nussbaum committed the association, its official publication, Conscience and Liberty, its board of trustees, general secretaries and members of invited advisor bodies that it's worthy, a target of word of being accomplished to defend the principle above any other principle or interest. A principle for each and every to defend and promote the right to hold or not hold, to practice or not practice, and to share the belief to adhere, to abandon, or to change religion. A IADLR seeks the faithful to this principle thought. We keep being faithful to this thought. Its official publications, through the official publications, online presence, and interventions in international forums, and through the meetings, conferences, congresses, and summits it has organized. But it is my belief which I know I share by the trustees of national leaders of the Association Internationale pour la Défense Liberté Religieuse, that most significant contribution of this association over time is to unite in purposeful personalities and institutions of goodwill. We do it with the means at our disposal and personalities, and we do that also personalities that work selflessly, but with the conviction that we relate to and bring together many who have the same vision, that a society that responds and promotes freedom of conscience, religion, and worship, that believes in that, that same freedom is, has an indispensable element for life in which the dignity of each individual and the communities to which they belong is preserved and valued. This conference is entitled Religion and Freedom of Expression. It is the resounding current and necessary theme. We have concerns, we are concerned and involved in contributing to the reflection on the discourse of religion in society and the discourse of religion on itself and in culture. We are also attentive to the most recent trends on new forms of limitation to discourse, perhaps less institutional, but more effective, which lead to an aggressive discourse and cancellation phenomena. 
Finally, we are aware of the responsibility we all have to contribute to peace and respect by expressing ourselves in a form that is desired to be free and constructive. With all this frame in mind, we have personally chosen each of you guests and honor, guests who honor us with your presence. We are, and I am personally looking forward to listening, learning, reflecting, and exchanging ideas and experiences. May every moment, formal and informal, of this conference contribute to this goal. Allow me to end with some special thanks and recognition. First of all, to the Gulbenkian Foundation, in the person of the President, for the kind and efficient hosting of this conference, by providing us with the space, one of, with the space that is one of the most prestigious visiting, meeting, and working rooms. Gulbenkian honored our association and offer a guarantee of the right quality of our conditions. Then to the Commission for Religious Freedom in the person of the President, Dr. José Eduardo Vera Jardim, a personality whose name is indelebly linked to freedom and liberties in Portugal, and in particular to the religious freedom as a lawyer member of parliament, minister, now president of the commission, finally has a person of goodwill. I would also like to say a word to the national sections of the Association Internationale pour Défense Liberté Religieuse, which were involved in the organization of this conference. In particular, a word of thanks to the Secretary General Paulo Macedo, who I would like to thank uh, in, for the organization of this event. I would like to thank the Portuguese section, which was tirelessly working to support this preparation. I want everyone to know that one of the main reasons that brings us here is in this format, is that the training of future leaders active organizers in, the, in their countries, whom we will see throughout our work, preparing themselves for the defense and promotion of religious freedom. Let's say this is a conference, but is a place where we want the leaders from the different countries to get acquainted with the organization and be more efficient in promoting other uh, events like this one. Finally, I would like to leave a reference to the Portuguese Republic. If we are here, leaders, academics, clerics, representatives of religious communities, it is because we are witnessing a moment of remarkable openness and commitment of the Portuguese authorities and society to the religious phenomenon. We are observers, beneficiaries, and participants of an advanced religious freedom law an institutional framework and a social environment that recognizes and values freedom and dialogue. We are also here to witness and demonstrate this to the community of participants we have invited. We thank you, Madam Minister, for your presence in this inaugural session, which gives us so much prestige. We ask that you be a faithful depositary of this testimony to the government of Portugal. Thank you all for your presence. May this be a conference of the encounter between women, men, institutions, and communities of goodwill in favor of religious freedom. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President uh, Mario Brito. I would invite now our President of the Honorary Committee, uh, Dr. Adam Adyang, to address to this conference. Obrigado.
Your Excellency, Madame Catarina Sarmento y Castro, Excellencies, brothers and sisters in humanity, all protocol observed. At the outset, allow me to express my profound gratitude to the leadership and the members of the Association Internationale pour la Défense de la Liberté for extending this invitation to me. I truly believe that the AIDLR is a very positive force in advancing human dignity throughout the world. The AIDLR is convinced in the genuine belief that the world will benefit more from peace than from conflict, more from love than from hate, and more from promoting a united human family than a divided one characterized by the rise of anti-Semitism, the oppression against the Christian minorities, and the rise of hatred against Muslims. The choice of team for this conference is therefore relevant and timely. Brothers and sisters, although there are many in this room who are recognized for their expertise on freedom of expression and religious liberties, one of them is in front of me, Ibrahim Salama. Allow me to share with you some reflection. While we are gathered here in Portugal, a such beautiful and peaceful country, freedom of expression and religious liberties are under serious attacks in the many parts of the world. We are witnessing serious religious freedom abuses, particularly against women. We cannot remain passive. We need to renew our commitment to protect religious freedom as enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We must strive for safeguarding the right to differ and dissent in terms of religious beliefs. Indeed, religious freedom is a right grounded in our nature as human beings. As recently stated by Congressman McGovern, and I quote, Unless freedom of religion belongs to everyone, it doesn't truly belong to anyone. End of quote. Freedom of expression and religious liberties are complementary and mutually reinforcing. Indeed, we are all witness to history how diversity of thoughts and beliefs and freedom of, to express them have significantly contributed and enhanced the struggle and the realization of human rights. Thoughts and views are intangible before they have been expressed, and the convictions are valuable for a person only if he or she can express them. The exercise of these two rights should not be seen or considered a zero-sum game, that the enjoyment of the one should always be at the expense of the other. Rather, we should always distinguish between free speech and hate speech to truly reaffirm the sanctity of both rights as cornerstone of human life. Indeed, UN Special Rapporteur has rightly emphasized that freedom of expression may not be lawfully restricted unless government can demonstrate the legality of actions taken and its necessity and proportionality in order to protect a specified legitimate objective. These safeguards are a simple recognition that absolute freedom of expression has led and continues to cause tragic violations of human rights and infringement on the rights of others at an unimaginable scale. 
for example, the Holocaust that led to the killings of millions of innocent people did not start with uh, lighting of the gas chambers, hate speech, and dehumanization of the order was the precursor to this tragedy. More recently, ongoing mass killings of Rohingya, the most persecuted group of our time, according to Antonio Guterres, and I conquer, has assumed the same dimension humiliation and denial of their humanity. I could have mentioned many other situations Indeed, the list is endless. When not exercised with care, freedom of expression can be a dangerous tool to provoke disharmony with those we disagree with, with deadly consequences. Brothers and sisters, manifestations of intolerance and discrimination on the ground of religion or belief occur in varying degrees. Too often, freedom of speech and expression has been invoked as a basis to insult and dehumanize the religious belief of those who are different from us. However, we must confront the uncomfortable question. Why do communities and individuals resort to this kind of approach? It all comes down to discrimination and intolerance. The Human Rights Council Resolution 1618 recognized that, quote, open, constructive, and respectful debate of ideas, as well as interfaith and intercultural dialogue at the local, national, and international levels can play a positive role in combating religious hatred, incitement, and violence, end of quote, through, for example, public statement against hate speech, interreligious dialogue, and debate. Brothers and sisters, recognizing the importance of freedom of speech and religious liberties, and in response to the alarming trends of growing xenophobia, racism, and intolerance around the world, UN Secretary General, launched in June 2019, the United Nations Strategy and Plan of Action on Hate Speech. I had the privilege to lead the development of that strategy and plan of action. The strategy emphasized the need to counter hate holistically and with full respect for freedom of opinion and expression while working in collaboration with relevant stakeholders including civil society organizations, religious leaders, media outlets, tech companies, and social media platforms. History reminds us of the importance of respecting and cherishing diversity, managing it constructively, and allowing its peaceful and full expression. Religious diversity, is a fundamental feature of human history. We should strive to promote education that specifically opens our mind to the other. Those who are politically, culturally, and religiously different and show them how the only future that works is one with, in which all people are respected as equals whatever their faith or culture may be. We cannot promote tolerance if we only commit to pass draconian legislative laws, often a top-down process to punish those whose beliefs are different from our own or think differently from us. Similarly, we cannot build peaceful and tolerant societies when sections of our communities are dehumanized, abused, or excluded from opportunities simply because of their beliefs or how they are dressed. Rather, we should support and encourage our people to see a world of fairness, 
justice and empowerment. Ultimately, discrimination and exclusion undermine people's dignity, equality of citizenship, deprives them of their voice and ability to participate in public life. Let me state that uh, one of the profound challenges facing humanity today is to guarantee religious freedom and beliefs without limiting the right to free speech or indeed other fundamental rights and freedoms enshrined in various human rights instruments. While it is important to guarantee free speech, no one should insult religions or beliefs of others because it is a direct affront to human dignity. However, the idea that uh, proper response to this affront is violence or murder of innocent citizens is unacceptable and contrary to the very ideal of human rights, humanity has strived to achieve for centuries. Freedom of speech is fundamental to our cherished manifestation of our collective humanity. It is through our enduring faith in this universality, indivisibility, and interdependence of human rights and the rule of law that we can realize a society envisioned in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in which all members of the human family can enjoy and exercise their fundamental rights and freedom in equality and dignity. Brothers and sisters in humanity, uh, to conclude, I wish to stress that it is insufficient to offer only reactive solution uh, to the attacks against freedom of religion and freedom of expression. The intolerance and discrimination based on religion or belief. Rather, more attention needs to be given to proactive solutions by dealing squarely with the underlying root causes of intolerance. The most rampant cause of intolerance and discrimination is the ignorance and lack of understanding of all the religions or beliefs. This state of affairs breeds misunderstanding, fear, suspicion, or mistrust of those who do not share religions or beliefs accepted by the majority in our communities. It is this ignorance, when not checked or addressed, that lead to stereotypes an enduring state of fear, distrust among the citizens, and ultimate conflicts. In addition to the role of religious leaders, prevention and elimination of intolerance based on attitude, practices, and patterns of religions and beliefs require also continuous education and interfaith dialogue. As a Muslim, I want to remind us that Islam is a religion lays down freedom in matters of religious beliefs. The Quran unequivocally declares there is no compulsion in matters of faith. Distinct is the way of guidance now from error. He who turns away from forces of evil and believes in God will surely hold fast to a handle that is strong and unbreakable. For God hears all and knows everything. Quran, verse two, Surah 2, verse 256. It is not surprising either that uh, Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 1,400 years ago, adopted the Charter of Medina which guarantees religious freedom for all. Deeply worried by the popular interpretation of Islam based on medieval Jewish interpretation, which denies religious liberty and freedom of thought, 
Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya, president of the Abu Dhabi Peace Forum, uh, convened in cooperation with the government of Morocco, a conference in 2016. The outcome was the adoption of an important docu document known as the Marrakesh Declaration. It was signed by more than 250 Muslim religious leaders, heads of state, and scholars. And this declaration, based on the Medina Charter, aims to defend the rights of religious minorities in Muslim countries. And while addressing the IRF summit a uh, couple of days ago in Washington, Bin Baya said, when all religions are at risk, it is in the best interest to join hands and cooperate with each other. I therefore challenge all of us present here to come up by the end of this conference with a stringent and clear message on the significance of religious liberty and freedom of expression in our two-day world in turmoil. Brothers and sisters in humanity, may the Lisbon Conference contribute to reinforce our conviction that communities and nations have nothing to fear from accepting other faiths and cultures in their society. Mutual respect is a sign of strength and not weakness. Multi obrigado. Thank you, Mr. President, for addressing us. Um, tenho o prazer de convidar uh, a vir aqui à frente o Vice-Presidente da Comissão da Liberdade Religiosa, o Dr. Fernando Soares Loja, que hoje representará o Dr. Vera Jardim, por motivos pessoais não pode estar presente. Muito obrigado. Senhora Ministra da Justiça, a professora Catarina Sarmenti Castro, o Sr. Conselheiro Guilherme de Oliveira Martins, Your Excellency, Mr. Adama Dieng, Pastor Mário Brito, Presidente da Associação Internacional para a Defesa da Liberdade Religiosa, Caro Dr. Paulo Sérgio Macedo, Secretário-Geral da Associação Internacional para a Defesa da Liberdade Religiosa, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, I'm here before you on behalf of Mr. Vera Jardim, the president of the Religious Freedom Commission, who, unfortunately for health issues and following his doctor recommendations, could not join us today. However, Mr. Vera Jardim asked me to convey to you his best regards and express his best wishes for this conference. We believe this will be a remarkable conference and a much anticipated one. On behalf of the Religious Freedom Commission, I thank the President and the Secretary General of the International Association for Religious Liberty for not only have chosen Lisbon, but most of all, for having chosen such an important theme to be discussed, freedom of speech. Freedom of conscience and freedom of speech are basic human rights under threat in a growing number of countries, even in traditional democratic countries, we would say beyond suspicion. We are living odd times. The eldest members of the Religious Freedom Commission in Portugal still remember the days when in Portugal nobody could speak freely, namely about politics. And it was with great joy that every people welcomed the arrival of freedom of speech back in 1974. We took it for granted. 
but we fear now that we were mistaken. Europeans got rid of political oppressive regimes decades ago, but now in several countries, even here in Europe, citizens are paying the price for speaking, speaking openly, but not freely. It was a time, the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. How Dickens would gaze at his countrymen and other Europeans if he could watch the way we are dealing with the most basic human rights, namely freedom of conscience and freedom of speech. This is indeed a much needed and a very timely conference. May God grant us the wisdom to find the way back to a system with full freedom of conscience and freedom of speech. Thank you. Muito obrigado, Dr. Soares Loja. Tenho o prazer de convidar a Sua Excelência, a Sra. Primeira, a Sra. Ministra da Justiça, a Professora Dra. Catarina Sarmenti Castro, para se dirigir. Muito obrigado. Monsieur le Président de l'Association internationale pour la défense de la liberté religieuse, Mr. Executive Administrator of the Foundation Carlos Gulbenkian, Mr. Ambassador, Mr. President of the Commission of Religious Freedom, and Mr. Vice President, Mr. President of the Honorary Committee of Association internationale pour la défense de la liberté religieuse, Madam United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief, Mr. Director of the Trustees Branch of the United Nations High Commissariat for Refugees, distinguished members of the Working Group for Interreligious Dialogue from the High Commissariat for Migrations, distinguished representative of religion communities of non-governmental organizations in the field of human rights, in particular religious freedom, distinguished moderators and participants on this conference, ladies and gentlemen. In this time of ours, we have been witnessing the worldwide resurgence of all forms of religiosity, from the awakening of Islam to the revival of Protestant, Protestant evangelism, from the renewal of Christianity to the dissemination of new religiosities in Eastern Europe, from the resurgence of religions in China to the multiplication of churches in Africa. And if in Europe in particular, this resurgence is received with some surprise, perhaps it is because the social, economic and political history of Europe has inadvertently distracted us from the evidence that religion is not only and always has been, a symbolic and social domain that permeates the life of all of us, but also a possibility of bonding the individual citizens with a specific collective identity. This need of bonding and of belonging also materializes in the experience of citizenship as a social contract, but Contrary to what was perhaps expected, citizenship did not replace religion, and today the response of both religion and citizenship to that same need is marked by a curious convergence or even competition. 
Indeed, the rationalization and globalization of the borders between religious and secular spaces resulting from the constitutional principles of the secularity of state of the state and the separation between states and churches are being diluted and for more than one reason. If, on one hand, our public and media space is increasingly occupied by the unvaluable work of many religious organizations in favor of those dealing with the most challenging problems of humanity, such as hunger or war, it also confronts us with the news of events of radicalism and violence, with statements evoking religious motives to compel us to question how we are experiencing religious freedom and the principles of separation and cooperation between the state and religious communities. It is in this context, after all, that reflection on the articulation and healthy coexistence between the principles of freedom of expression and religious freedom becomes imperative. Hence, the enormous relevance of the topics that this conference proposes to tackle, namely the tension between freedom of religious expression and freedom of expression about religion, the limits of religious discourse and discourse about religion, or the effect of the constraint of speech on the rights of religious freedom. I therefore congratulate all those who are gathering here today for this reflection and this debate, since the common objective of putting religious discourse and discourse about religion at the service of the promotion of peace and understanding, I am sure, unites us all. The principle of religion's freedom and the exercise of this freedom are one of the main states, mainstays of the democratic state of law in the view of protecting religious conscious, conscience, protecting those individuals who practice a minority religion, but also to those who are faithful to the commandments of a majority religious creeds, or even those who do not have a religion, whether atheists or agnostics. This principle, therefore, implies not only the freedom to change religious or belief, but also the freedom to manifest one's religion or belief, alone or in common, both in public or in private areas, as prescribed by the Article 18 of Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In our country, the Constitution of the Portuguese Republic enshrines the separation between states and religion in an expression of inclusive secu secularism that must guarantee conditions for dialogue between religious communities to take place in the civic, political, and religious experience of each one of us. But the principle of the secularity of the state and the separation between state and religion should not prevent us from carrying out a continuous joint, joint effort towards coexistence and dialogue between people of faith and agnostics. On the contrary, the principle of secularity of the state must imply the intransigent defense of tolerance as a way of guaranteeing that everyone can freely, without suffering discrimination or aggression, express their belief and their lack or, or their lack of belief. I will not dwell at length on the invaluable or invaluable contribution that, in this matter, we owe to the Commission on Religious Freedom, an independent consulting body of the Portuguese Parliament and the government. But I will say that the Law 16 of 20, uh, 21 uh, of June, uh, um, in which 25 years after the approval of the Portuguese Constitution, 
created the Commission of Religious Freedom and which resulted from a modern and inclusive vision of the Portuguese secularism. And I can tell you that, as a Minister of Justice, I feel very honored to have the support and helpful cooperation of Mr. Vera Jardim, President of the Commission of Religious Freedom, who has been, in fact, for many years and in many ways, central to the role that the Commission has played in promoting coexistence and dialogue between religious communities and between these and non-believers. That is central to tolerance, since tolerance presents itself as the recognition of diversity and respect for the identity of the other. In fact, due to religious pluralism, all citizens have the obligation to tolerate others, recognize diversity and respect the identity of others. Therefore, if dialogue is possible, and it must be possible, this exercise of tolerance will inevitably have to take place within religion it's themselves. In other words, if Hans Kuhn is right and there will be no peace between nations if there is no peace between religions. There will be no peace between religions if there is no dialogue between religions. Then everything must be done to promote this dialogue, which implies debating in good faith and in goodwill the difficulties that always emerge from attempts to harmonize principles and values considered fundamental, but that are not, for that reason, non-conflicting. Genuine dialogue requires respect for identities. And if those who join that dialogue must do it with the joy of their convictions, it is because the very authenticity and sincerity of that journey also calls them to keep alive the integrality of their own faith. Maybe affirming one, one's religion implies, by definition, denying all others as a logical consequence of faith. But it is in this context that religious tolerance must be the recognition of diversity and respect for the identity of the other, to guarantee that all can freely express their beliefs without fear of suffering, discrimination, or aggression. This is the proper setting from the debate on the issues of religious tolerance, has a, li a limit to freedom of expression, a setting on which, moreover, the European Convention on Human Rights has something to say. Indeed, in Article 10, the European Convention on Human Rights, by ensuring freedom of expression, provides, provides in its second paragraph for the possibility of limiting this right. But in what sense is that allowed? Let us remember that fundamental rights, including freedom of expression and religion, and religious freedom, can only be conceived in the context of an open public debate. And let us remember, at the same time, that the democracies cannot be afraid of the debate. This means that the only idea, ideas whose dissemination should be prohibited are those that prove to be incompati incompatible, incompatible with democratic principles, that is, those that incite hatred and that aim to restrict this public debate. Thus, the restrictions, sanctions, and formalities that the Convention imposes on freedom of expression must be interpreted restrictively and exclusively to defend the legitimate interests set out in the Convention. And this is undoubtedly the case of, the, of hate speech, unequivocally contrary to the values of tolerance, social peace, 
and non-discrimination underlying the Convention. Allow me to briefly tell you, in this broader context, something about the Portuguese reality. Indeed, the fifth period report on Portugal by the Human Rights Committee on the United Nations on the application of the International Convenant on Civil and Political Rights, adopted on April 2020, noted in the final remarks that Article 240 of our Penal Code restricts the criminal type to organized propaganda activities, not covering incitement to discrimination, and that the incriminating norm does not cover discrimination based on language and other situations. Therefore, the committee urged the Portuguese Republic to consider the possibility of amending Article 240 of the Penal Code in order to ensure its compatibility with Articles 20 and 26 of the Convenants and to take, and ta and to take all measures needed to guarantee that its application offers complete and effective substantive and procedural protection against the discrimination on all grounds prohibitive, prohibited by the Convenants and in all areas and sectors including incitement to discrimination, and to strengthen its efforts to combat intolerance, stereotypes, prejudice and discrimination against vulnerable and minority groups, including Roma committees, people of African descendants, Mus Muslims and lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and intertex people. On the other hand, as a part of a European Action Plan Against Racism, the European Commission has warned of all of serious concerns about whether uh, national penal codes in general correctly criminal, criminalize hate speech and hate crimes. On this matter, one must enlighten, Portugal was one of the first member states to adopt a plan which was approved in, 19, in, in, in 2021 the National Plan Against Racism and Discrimination, Portugal Against Racism, contemplating as one of the planned activities the revision of the Article 2040 uh, of Penal Code, 240 of Penal Code. In this context, it is understandable that one of the priorities of the government program is precisely to reinforce the mechanisms to preventing and repressing hate speech and the amendment to Article 204 of the Penal Code proved to be essential and it is already in legislative circuit. The problems that will be addressed in this conference focused on the tension between freedom of speech and religion are very complex. You will struggle with many doubts. You will reflect on many points of tension. Let one certainty guide you. If we want religious freedom not to imply limiting freedom of expression and to ensure that religious speech and about religion fulfill their role as promoters and keepers of peace and understanding as they should. If the long-term objective is that all members of democratic society can peacefully express their ideas regarding their beliefs of, uh, the beliefs of others in order to generate a public and constructive debate, then it is imperative to promote dialogue between different confessions and ethnic groups as the foundation of an education built by all, an education that promotes a better understanding on beliefs of others and consequently increases the level of tolerance in society. In Portugal, we face times where minority religious groups have and will, be, have and will, be, will keep the freedom to manifest their faith or any religious belief which, as is well known, does not happen in other parts of the world. However, these peaceful, transitory moments of collective coexistence do not mean that we can or should take everything for granted. 
It is that for, therefore, with great intellectual curiosity and with, with ineffable pleasure that we, alchem, we, we welcome you all and wish for the most fruitful debate on such an important matter. Thank you. Muito obrigado, Sra. Ministra da Justiça. Uh, antes de encerrarmos a nossa primeira sessão, cerimónia de abertura, eu gostaria de convidar todos a que pudéssemos aproveitar este momento, até porque temos algum tempo dentro do nosso programa, a fazermos já a nossa fotografia de grupo. Portanto, eu convidava que pudéssemos ir à escadaria principal quando nos dirigirmos para a saída, todos juntos, uh, que pudéssemos fazer a nossa fotografia e depois dirigimos-nos de imediato para o nosso coffee break, Estaremos aqui pelas 11 horas para iniciarmos os nossos trabalhos da, da segunda sessão, da primeira sessão de trabalhos propriamente dita. Em nome da Sra. Ministra, em nome do Dr. Guilherme Oliveira Martins, eu dou por encerrada a nossa sessão de abertura. Muito obrigado a todos.